morning and welcome along to another one of our past conversations. Joined today by Dr. Callum Watson, our first medievalist that we've spoken to, so I'm very excited about that. Callum gained his PhD from the University of Edinburgh, where he looked at attitudes towards chivalry and knighthood in 14th and 15th century Scotland. In his day-to-day -day role, he's a steward at Blackness Castle, so very much got his head in medieval history, that's for sure. That's enough from me, I'm going to pass over to Callum now and he can tell you a wee bit about himself and say hello. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I graduated with my PhD way back in 2016 um, and uh, my PhD really looked at two particular sources, uh, the Bruce by a gentleman called John Barber, the Archdeacon of Aberdeen, written in the 1370s about Robert Bruce and uh, another long narrative poem based uh, at least in part on uh, the Bruce known as the Wallace, which tries to do the same thing for William Wallace as Barber had done for the Bruce, uh, written by an otherwise quite obscure figure known only as Blind Harry. Um, and both of those sources have a great many problems when it comes to using them to rebuild the kind of narrative of Robert Bruce's life, um, and especially uh, William Wallace's life, because Blind Harry is writing some 150 plus years after Wallace died. Both authors though, both Barber and Blind Harry, are at pains to emphasize the point that Robert Bruce was the greatest knight of his generation, and that by the same token, William Wallace was the greatest knight um, of his generation. So. The point of the PhD was to look at how those characters are constructed and how some of the other characters in the uh, poems are constructed um, and to see what that tells us about the understandings of their audiences in the 1370s and the 1470s, uh, how those audiences understood the idea of the perfect knight and knighthood in general, um, what qualities they should have, um, looking at how far uh, Barber and Harry agreed uh, on those uh, on that on that question, uh, but also how they differed and what that tells us about the state of the the Scottish political community because these are both um, highly politi politicized works. Um, so looking at at how the different political and social um, contexts of these two poems influenced that idea of chivalry in Scotland. What makes uh, the perfect night. Callum, the, the first question that we typically ask anyone that we speak to is about their, their memories of studying history at school. So I wonder, does anything stand out for you? Yeah, I mean, I always really enjoyed history at school. Um, I was really lucky that I had some uh, great teachers, in particularly there was a Mrs. Vahid, um, who uh, I, I would have first had probably around sort of year five of high school, sort of just before doing A-levels. And then she was my teacher right the way through until I, I went off to university. And she really um, cultivated that enthusiasm and kind of nurtured that, that passion. Um, and I, th I think the, the thing that really drew me into history uh, were the stories. And... I appreciate that as historians that we're supposed to uh, avoid just producing narrative histories where we just describe a, a sequence of events. But um, even so, even now, um, it, a, a, a huge part of the, uh, the, the appeal of, of history were, were those stories that, you know, every, every uh, period that you study, every sort of new topic you came onto at, at high school, there would be these sort of fascinating, exciting, um, often kind of larger than life stories uh, that had a huge advantage over the kind of stories that you looked at in something like English Lit because they were full of real people uh, who had so much more depth than, you know, created characters. And so there was so much more scope to get involved and, and pick these uh, these things apart. Uh, when I went to university, when I started university, I, uh, I actually di didn't come to university expecting to be a medievalist. Um, I, I, I actually thought my interests lay sort of 
18th, 19th century uh, British history. But because I, uh, I'm, I'm from the northeast of England originally, um, and I came up to Edinburgh to university, I did the course that uh, in those days was Scottish History 1, which took you from something like 3000 BC right the way through to, I, th I think it ended with the Union of the Crowns in 1707. Uh, so obviously there's a big medieval um, element who we covered the nearly the first 5,000 years of the course in um, you know the, the, the first week um, but uh, I, I did that Scottish history course really just because it was my first time in Scotland and I thought I should do you know a, 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 a little bit of work on actual Scottish history while I was here um, and again, it, it came down to uh, teachers, the, the first two um, lecturers for that course, James Fraser, uh, who now teaches at Guelph University, and Steve Boardman, who uh, still teaches at um, Edinburgh, um, and who ended up being my PhD supervisor. Uh, they were so uh, enthusiastic, they were so entertaining, uh, they, they really made um, sort of you know, classical, uh, early medieval, and later sort of high and late medieval history come to life. And I, I was just sucked in uh, from then on and, and, you know, carried on doing uh, odd medieval courses here and there right the way through until um, I hit uh, my MSc, my master's year, at which point I, I, I decided I would focus specifically in on, on the medieval. Your PhD research was, was focused upon medieval Scotland and certainly when I think about that time period and, and I'm sure a lot of people are the same, we, we kind of look at it almost through the lens of Robert the Bruce and, and William Wallace and, and I just wonder why do you think these two figures in particular remain so iconic? Uh, I mean I think a big part of that is that they, they were in themselves kind of larger than life. Uh, they lived very um, exciting, adventurous, dramatic lives full of uh, intrigue, battles. Um, they, uh, beyond that, uh, even the sources through which we learn about them, uh, things like the Bruce or the Wallace, uh, these add to that sense of excitement and adventure. They retell the lives of, of these people in the most exciting and often exaggerated um, fashion. So in the Bruce, we have, you know, Bruce being ambushed by assassins in the woods and saved by his dog. Uh, we have him defending a ford alone against 200 guys. We have him uh, wading through the moat at uh, Perth to throw up a ladder against the wall at um, Perth and being the first person over the wall. Um, once the assault starts, we have him killing uh, Henry de Boon in single combat on the first day of the Battle of Bannockburn as this sort of, you know, this is the first blood spilled uh, battle. For the Wallace we have, uh, he goes off to France, uh, fights pirates on the way, wrestles the King of France as a lion. Um, so the, the, the very nature of the, the way that we can try and reconstruct the lives of these, these people it invites that sense of danger and excitement and adventure and so forth. Um, but e even as we get beyond that, even, you know, as, as you get into more sort of academic and scholarly assessments of these characters, uh, there's, there's no two ways about it. For Robert Bruce, um, his life and career shapes the whole of Scotland's 14th and 15th century history and kind of beyond. Um, the Scots live with and have to come to terms with Robert Bruce's legacy for well over 100, 200 years after he dies. There's no way to tell Scotland's late medieval history without accounting for Robert Bruce in one way or another, whether you think he's a hero or a villain or somewhere in between. And the fact that his life and career and that the decisions he makes as king um, influence Scottish society, Scottish governmental policy, 
um, for so long also affects Anglo-Scottish relations. So it, you know, it affects um, relations across the Irish Sea or affects relations with um, the Netherlands and the Low Countries with uh, France and so forth. So it, it, it very it very quickly kind of spirals out to have British and indeed European consequences. Um, for Wallace, um, I, I suppose he he is a, a, a he's an easy character to turn into a folk hero. Um, more so than Bruce. I mean, goodness knows there's enough Bruce's caves and Bruce's trees and Bruce's wells around around Scotland. Um, you know, Bruce, part of the reason he looms so large um, in the sort of popular consciousness is that he, he does become a, a folk hero of a sort. But I mean, even in his own lifetime, William Wallace cuts this almost sort of Robin Hood figure. Um, and because he is, you know, he's not a king, um, he's not even a lord. He's probably the son of a, 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 a yeoman, a kind of tenant farmer. Um, he is is much easier to turn into this character who is, um, you know, tied his horse to that tree over there or drank from that well when he was passing through on his way to uh, Stirling Bridge or whatever it may be. Um, and that certainly accounts for um, why, uh, to, to, to go back to the Bruce and the Wallace, the Wallace, once it's taken out of its historical context in the in the sort of 1470s, 1480s, becomes far more popular than the Bruce. It's one of the first books to be printed in Scotland, and from that point onwards, it is kind of in constant circulation. Um, and it's because William Wallace is kind of Scotland's answer to Robin Hood. He's this guy who sort of emerges from the forest and, um, you know, attacks and frustrates and resists, um, you know, bad governmental um, influence while waiting for the good government to come with the hero, King Robert Bruce, who he, you know, in the Wallace inspires to actually take up the, um, the, uh, the, uh, mantle of king and the responsibilities of king. Uh, so both of them, I think, uh, survive to some extent because they're easy to romanticize, um, but also they are easy to romanticize because they have such a, a significant impact on you know the world in which uh, they lived and the, the history of their own time, but also um, subsequent history, particularly for, for Bruce. Callum, your, your day to day role at the moment, um, part of that is um, being a steward at Blackness Castle. And I'm just curious, what, what does that involve? Yeah, so um, as a steward, you are basically responsible for all of the elements of keeping a site open and operating on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, that includes uh, showing people around the castle, answering questions, um, you know, actually uh, engaging with the sort of the history of the site. Um, it might mean uh, taking education groups on tours, um, helping them with um, object handling and, uh, you know, actual sort of learning exercises uh, in and around the castle. But it also involves cleaning the castle, opening it on a morning, closing it on a night, uh, ordering stock for the gift shop. Um, so it's, it's a, uh, it is a really varied, um, uh, often uh, quite uh, surprising uh, kind of a, a, a job. Uh, you, you fulfill lots of rules um, over the course of a day, a week, um, uh, it, and as a result, uh, I think it's it's very rewarding, um, but it also it lets you play to different strengths. Um, I've, I've obviously uh, come at Heritage from a, something of a more uh, scholarly, academic -y sort of background, um, so I've been able to get out in the castle and answer people's questions and engage more with that kind of education side of things, taking kids around, um, trying to help them. Uh, understand 
how the castle has changed in the 600 years that it's that it's existed um how different bits of it worked and so forth how you can tell some bits are medieval some bits are early modern um but if you uh, are interested and passionate about history and heritage um but you aren't comfortable talking to 20 kids in the middle of a castle uh you can focus in more on the sort of admin side or on the um the uh maintenance side of things so um the the sort of steward jobs that, that has kind of have a little bit of something for everyone i think Hez is also a fantastically interconnected um, organization. Uh, so although technically I am employed at Blackness Castle, um, the other sites um, communicate with one another all the time um, and they very often trade off staff, um, you know, especially in quiet periods of the year in the winter when it's kind of off season people are taking holidays and so forth and they know that someone is at a loose end um, at one of the other sites, uh, you might find yourself called in to cover at a site nearby. Um, I have done shifts at Linlithgow, which is just down the road from um, Blackness Castle. Uh, I've done quite a lot of shifts at uh, Craig Miller Castle, uh, which is in Edinburgh, just down the road from, from where I stay. Um, I was really disappointed I got offered a couple of days at Bothwell, which is one of my favourite castles and is, was the, the preferred residence of one of my favourite figures from Scottish history, Archibald the Grim. Uh, but unfortunately, that was to cover for someone's Christmas holidays and I was also away at that point. So I, I still have yet to get to um, Bothwell, um, but keeping my fingers crossed. Um, so, yeah, uh, the the job at, um, at has. Uh, is is uh, very uh, rich and varied. And just lastly, before we have to end our conversation, Callum, I'm wondering if you were given advice to a young person who might be looking towards either future study or perhaps a career in history, what would you say to them? Yeah, um, I think in terms of uh, looking to study history, uh, I think that my 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 the the thing I would want to disabuse people of is this notion that history is about remembering dates or remembering names or remembering facts. Uh, the which is something that a lot of history teachers try to instill in me um, to to no avail, and it was the the most sort of freeing thing to to discover as I. Uh, I got more into um, uh, studying history that you can always look up a date or a name or a place if you forget it. Um, history is about trying to understand people um, and understand patterns, um, understand people's motivations, um, understand the way that uh, people influence societies and societies influence uh, people. Uh, so you know, if if you are trying to get into history and realizing that, you know, you find it really difficult to tell is, you know, 1375, is that the 13th century or the 14th century? Don't worry about it. You, the, the, a, the more you do it, the more that stuff will sink in anyway, but also at the end of the day, you can just look that stuff up. Um, what's important um, when you're studying history is to try and develop an understanding of the peoples and the societies that you are studying. Um, in terms of looking for a career in, um, in uh, heritage um, and in history, uh, I would say volunteer is a, a, a big thing. And that's actually not something that I did before I, I started working in um, the heritage uh, sector um, and that, that I kind of wish I did. Um, a, because um, it, 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 it is a really good way to nurture your passion um, and, and, and to give you a, a, a you know, to, to, to put you in a, an environment where you can uh, make the most of your interests, um, but also to, to see how varied heritage work is 
um, and to see the bits that you think interest you the most and that you'd like to sort of focus on um, or to see if there are any bits um, that you're not so keen on. As I say, you know, if you're not um, uh, that keen on talking to a, to a group of 20 people and, and trying to help them understand, you know, what Robert Bruce was thinking at the Battle of Bannockburn or, you know, why Edward did what he did there, that's okay. Um, you know, there are other things to be in the heritage sector other than um, a tour guide. Um, so by, by volunteering at, at sites, you'll get to see um, that, you know, these uh, workplaces are uh, quite diverse and have lots of, um, provide lots of different opportunities for you to, to sort of play to your strengths. Um,